The hymn Amazing Grace is one of the most recognizable songs in the English-speaking world. It is a song of hope, forgiveness, and redemption. It was one of Coach Royal's favorite hymns. Here again are the Kyle sisters. Amazing grace, how sweet. sisters are amazing and Chad Hudson obviously added a lot to their performance as well. To say that coach loved the game of golf would be an understatement and to define his love for our next speaker would be impossible. Daryl and Edith watched Ben Crenshaw grow up in Austin and become one of the greatest golfers the game has ever known. Daryl loved his passion and admires it, admired his talent. To the world which embraced him, he was a Masters champion and a Ryder Cup captain. But to Darrell, he would always be Ben Boy, the kid who never, ever forgot his roots. And now here is Ben Crenshaw. I feel like I lost a part of my life last week. I think Johnny Johnson said that. I think it said it best. I grew up in the shadow here of the University of Texas. And I count my lucky stars 
about so many things growing up here. My mother and dad, my dad was a lawyer here in Austin, and my mother was a school teacher. She was a sixth grade school teacher who taught David. Uh, but my father, who was a lawyer here, uh, fell in to a group of friends, one of them named Wally Scott, the other one Frank Denius, two of the biggest Longhorn supporters ever. And we grew up around all the coaches' kids. And during that time, I was very young. Uh, one of my earliest recollections was sitting in the knot hole section in the north end zone when uh, we played Baylor in 1963. Uh, I couldn't believe that game. First of all, my dad was from Baylor. Uh, but he was, a, he was a great friend of Wally's. And uh, Duke Carlisle came out of nowhere to make that interception. It was the most unbelievable thing I ever saw. But that, you know, we won the national championship that year. But when Darrell got here, he changed things, he changed the dynamics of Austin. He changed the way of athletics at the University of Texas. And he was so successful right off the bat that all of us, all of Austin and the state of Texas was swept up in his success. I kept growing up and we kept winning games around here. And then it, uh, it culminated uh, in the 1969 and 1970 national championships. And it got to be so almost commonplace, we knew we were going to win. But it was Coach Royal and his coaches that imbibed in, in their players uh, such, such, let's say, following of what they wanted to achieve on the field. And what a team. They always, when they took the field, they looked like they were rested, ready, and proud to play a force to be reckoned with. You know, winning the three national championships culminating in, in 69 and 70, I was just old enough to, I was signed to a four-year scholarship here at University of Texas to play golf. And uh, maybe part of that winning tradition had something to do with Tom Kite and I winning, helping to win a national championship in golf in 71 and 72. But my traveling and playing golf, Coach Royal and, and specifically Coach Campbell most of their assistant catch coaches loved to play golf. And it was a perfect release for them. What they were trying to do on the field during the season and when they stopped playing, and, uh, it, golf provided them a great release valve. And oh gosh, they loved to play. Coach Royal uh, played so many rounds of golf and so many places. Uh, it was a it's a story in itself, Edith, that you let him play that much golf. <laughs> but you knew he loved it, and he was with his friends. And I think that, um, you know, part and parcel of after Coach retired in 77, he, there's no question that he wanted to be with as many friends as he could and do good things. He wanted to be with musicians, of course. And, you know, I, I always think that after uh, the picking parties in Houston that was started with Willie that came from the Woodlands back up here to Austin, one of my greatest honors was to be named with uh, Coach Royal and Willie for the Ben, Willie, and Darrell, which was formed to to have their friends together, and God, friends came from all over the world. Musicians, uh, athletes, 
boosters, friends, all came in an effort to, uh, to have a great time, but also to help people. And help they did. Uh, East Austin Youth Charities were the great benefit, and so many of their subsidiaries certainly we like to think we helped a lot of people. Coach Royal, to me, was such a different person. He was a very direct, he always knew what to say at the right time. He could get his players to do what he wanted. I see so many of you out here today that I think about what, where you've been in life and what would it be without Coach Royal. It's very much the same. I feel that way about Daryl, but I also feel the same way about my old teacher, Harvey Penick. One day, uh, I was watching Coach Royal up on the practice tee and somebody, he was practicing with his swing and Harvey looked like, he said, I, I don't think Coach looks right. I'm going to go there and talk to him. So he went over there, and he could tell right off the bat that someone had told him to swing a certain way. And he said, now, Coach, somebody has told you if you, if you could hook the ball, you could get 15 or 20 more yards. Is that right? And Coach said, yes, sir, that's right. And so, and so Harvey said, Coach, that's not you. You should aim a little left and let that ball drift a little bit to the right. So I guess in some ways he turned the table and said, you need to, you need to dance with the one who brung you. <laughs> so I'll tell you another time, coach was practicing by himself at Barton Creek. He, he was a practicer and he, he kept hitting the ball and I saw him over there by himself. So I went over there and I said, you look like you're swinging well. He said, Ben boy, he always, always called me Ben boy. He said. He said, it doesn't quite feel right. And I said a couple of tips, but I don't know what possessed me. But I said, coach, a good golf shot must feel like a good punt. Well, you talk about the light going on. He, we stopped and we talked about punting for 40 minutes. <laughs> because I knew that's how he and his brother grew up in Oklahoma. They didn't have anything but a football and they kicked it all the time. Matter of fact, my first, my brother Charlie and I, our first football was given to us by Dana Bible out in our yard. And he said, here boys, I want you to take this football and I want you to scuff it up real good. But um, kicking, you know, we related it to timing in the swing and also how you could punt. And I said, Coach, it must be, it must have been difficult to punt in Oklahoma with that wind blowing. He said, oh, Ben Boy, you had to drop it just right. You had to get your timing right. Obviously, his teams reflected a great importance on the kicking game. Um, I, there's a, one of the greatest sports writers of all time was Grantland Rice. And his publications were well known in the 30s, 40s, and the 50s. And he had, his habit was to write verses. And this one, I think, applies to Coach Royal a bit. It's called Past Glories. Dream, if you will, of the fame that once made you one of the upper set. But only remember, they rarely remember as quickly as they forget. Too many have rushed to the heights that you surrendered that only the mob can see. So please don't expect you can ever collect for the fellow you used to be. You had your day and you had your glory, but time sets a dizzy pace. They filled the gap in a blasting hurry the second you quit the race. Take it out in dreams if there's nothing better for the old chairs loud and free. But please don't expect you can ever collect for the winner you used to be. That doesn't quite 
Coach Royal retired on his own terms and never looked back. He was happy about how he, what he achieved. And with Edith, you made a fabulous, fabulous team. You allowed him to do all those things. Uh, I loved Coach Royal and everything that he stood for. May he live in our hearts forever. The relationship between Darrell Royal and Mac Brown began almost 30 years ago, and no one could have imagined at the time that it would eventually evolve into a father-son type relationship that would rejuvenate Darrell and redefine football at the University of Texas. The bond, and it was a powerful union, served both men equally. Their journey would lead them to a great friendship and it would lead Texas back to its rightful place among the elite in college football. Ladies and gentlemen, the guy who brought the wishbone back one more time, here is Mac Brown. I know first that coach would think we all a little bit over the top because we dressed up and we put on a coat and tie. And he would not like that. He'd rather be in blue jeans and tennis shoes. I know that. I know too that he would think it's so foolish that our staff is over here when we got TCU coming up. How dumb is that that you're not working, boy? Because I've heard some of that without, without question. Miss Edith asked me to talk about lessons learned from coach in my 15 years here. Uh, gosh, that'd take years not just today, but I'm going to try to, uh, to put it in a, a capsulized form here for all of us. That the most amazing thing to me about Coach, which I loved, is he took very complicated things and, and made them seem simple. And I would be sitting around worried about things, and I'd ask him about them, and he would come back and say, no, 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 you're at the wrong place here, let's do this. And <laughs> I'm Diane King Hall from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Well, blue chips are holding on to gains this afternoon, but they are off the highs of the session. Let's go through all the numbers. I just don't. And it made sense to me because I love to fish. I thought, what a great day that is. So it made you feel really, really good. I met Coach back in uh, 85. We were at Tulane. We were struggling. And uh, Mr. Jamel, who couldn't be here today and is watching, uh, wanted me to... Uh, tell this story, and it's not about Tulane, it's not about me, it's really about Coach. We brought him in as a, a consultant. We just dropped basketball at Tulane. We had uh, 45 players on scholarship, and 41 of them were on academic probation, so it wasn't good. And he and Don Canham from Michigan, and, and uh, Gene Corrigan, who was at Notre Dame as an athletic director, and Coach Royal and Chuck Ninas came in to evaluate our program. So they spent three days, and growing up in a, a high school coaching family in Cookville, Tennessee, you love Coach Royal, you love Coach Bryant, uh, you, you always looked up to John McKay and Bo Beckler and, and Woody Hayes. I mean, those were the guys that, that my granddad always talked about and Wally Butts at Georgia. So these guys were coming in. Well, the only one I really knew was Coach Royal. And in the 60, late 60s, when I was in high school, Texas was a, a TV darling with a national championship. So that's who we watched, and we loved it. And, and we were proud Saturday to, to I was so proud of the staff to put the wishbone out there. And we had number 30 at fullback, number 24 at halfback. And uh, we screwed up, Chris. We had eight throwing it, so it didn't work very good for you. So uh, 25 can't throw where we'd have had that where it should have been. But Coach Roll came in, and they spent three days, and they came in. We were meeting with them. I'll never forget. We were pay paying them $1,200 as consultants, and Chuck Ninas and, and Don Canham and Gene Corrigan all said, well, son, you're going to be okay. This is going to work. And just keep your head down. We need to get some more money into the program, but this is going to work. It's going to be work. They got to Coach Roll, and he said, hell, boy, get out of here as fast as you can. And I said, uh, one of them said, Coach, you can't say that. And he said, I damn sure can. I like the boy. They said, well, he paid you $1,200 to try to be a consultant. And he said, here's your money back, Coach, but get out of here and get to a university with the in front of it as fast as you can. You don't need to be at an independent school. I left the next year. 
And then all of a sudden, Sally and I uh, meet with a committee in, in Atlanta before we came here. And Coach Rowe was in the committee. And after the committee meeting, we sat there and we talked a little bit. And I said, Coach, what do you have to do to be a successful head football coach at the University of Texas? And it was really good. He said, the University of Texas is a different place. He said, you got a lot of different factions. And what happened, it's like a box of BBs. And, and, and we dropped the box, and the BBs are all over the place. And he said, it'd be your job as the head football coach at Texas to get the BBs back in the box. And he said, if you can get those BBs back in that box now, it's a real powerful place. And that made a lot of sense to me, too. I can see BBs got scattered a couple of years ago again. I'm trying to get them back in the box. That's just what we do around here. So all of a sudden, I said, what else, coach? And he said, you got to reach out to your lettermen. They're the ones that built the place. And don't you ever forget that. Reach out to your high school coaches because they're the ones that send you the great players that they've coached in this state. And we've lost our connection with high school coaches. Reach out to your alums. Reach out to your faculty. Reach out to your, to your grassroots people. Not everybody could afford to come to Texas that loves the school. And he said, you got to reach out to the media. And he said, oh, there's one other thing. You need to win all them damn games too, boy. And he said, and they're not in that order. And all, all of a sudden, one of the, the greatest days of my life, Coach came in and he said, I want you to wear this T-ring. I said, Coach, that's for Letterman at the University of Texas. And he said, I know what it is. I'm the one who designed it. And I said, well, I, I'm not from here. I don't think I should wear it. He said, shut up, boy. I'm not from here either. You're the head coach at Texas. I want you to wear it, and you're wearing it. I put it on. I've had it on every day since and, and uh, cherish it very, very much. Also, the other thing he told me is he says, when you're the head coach at Texas, it's a prominent position. A lot of people are going to give attention to that position. So if you accept this job, don't ever walk by someone without signing an autograph or taking a picture if they ask you to, no matter how old or how young, no matter what the timing is. And he said, you also need to remember that it's not about you. It's about the position, and the next guy that takes the position will be signing the same autographs and taking the same pictures. But you need to do that if you're going to be the coach at the University of Texas. Then all of a sudden, we're at my first day of practice, and I'm so proud. I'm standing out there with Coach, and uh, I'm right next to him. I thought, this is pretty cool. I mean, Willie Nelson, George Strait, Coach, this is pretty cool stuff. Now, this is... So we're standing there, and a young high school coach comes up to me and says, or up to Coach, and he says, Coach, how can I be like you? I want to be a prominent coach at a prominent place. Coach said, how long you got? He said, well, I, I'm going to be here through all the practice. And coach put it very simply. If you got it, you'll make it. If you don't have it, you won't make it. And if you don't know what it is, you got no chance to make it. <laughs> Young guy turned and walked off. Coach looked at me and said, hell, he ain't got it. <laughs> and Ben was talking about the kicking game. You did not want to get in that discussion now. We had three block punts against NC State and lost the game my second year here. And um, I was waiting on the call. I knew it was coming. And finally it came, and he said, Coach, how you doing? I said, not very good, Coach. He said, didn't punt it very well, did you? I said, no, sir. In fact, we didn't get it off. It's a problem. He said, hell, I'd have faked some of them if you're that bad punting. He said, you might have won the game. Then we lost the game very badly, and I was on the bus coming home, and I, I made a critical mistake, and, and I said our, I thought our team quit. So I got home that night, and Edith would know. Coach had called me late at night, and he'd said, uh, bad day, huh? He said, ah, I got beat once in 72, a lot worse than you did. So he said, don't, don't think it's just you, boy. He said, it, it's happened around here before. You'll be fine. He said, don't get too high on those days you win because you didn't play as good as everybody thinks you did. He said, don't get as low as you are right now on the bad days because you're going to have some more. He said, that's just part of it. But he said, let me tell you something. Teams don't quit. Individuals quit. And he said, don't you ever say that your team quit again because you got some guys when you watch that video tonight that played really, really well and played really hard. And you shouldn't have put them in that category, which was so true as we go through it. And then he always talked to me about the media. He said, after a win... You don't have to say anything because it's all good. Just brag on the players. He said after a loss, you can't say anything because it's all bad. So blame yourself because everybody else is going to anyway, which is true. And then he said the other thing I've learned is they can't quote no comment. 
So he said, the thing I would tell you to do more than anything else is he said, uh, uh, the less you say, the less you have to take back. And that made so much sense to me as well. He also said, don't listen to everybody around you. You got too many people that think they know what they're doing and they really don't. And he says, you don't need to tell them they don't because that hurts their feelings worse. But he said, pick five or six people out that you really trust and you really admire. And he said, reach out to them and ask them what you should do and ask their, their questions. And, and if you've got respect for them, they'll give you the respect back. He also said that uh, don't read the newspaper and listen to all the stuff. He said at the end, uh, there's going to be a real positive stack over here and there's going to be a real negative stack over here and they're going to be about the same height. And he said, really and truly, the positive ones aren't near true because you didn't do near as good as they said you did. And he said, the, the negative ones aren't true because you didn't do near as bad as they said you did. So just forget it and go coach. And he said, you should worry more about putting the product on the field than worry about what somebody thinks about you because in your position, you got 25 million people that think about something you do wrong every day. And I asked him what the, the best thing about coaching at Texas was, coaching football, and he said, 25 million people care every day about what you do. And I said, Coach, what's the worst thing about coaching at Texas? And he said, 25 million people care about what you do every day. And then lastly, the, Sally and I have had so many wonderful things that have happened in our lives since we've come to Texas, none more important to us than having Edith and Coach in our lives. I'll never forget at the national championship game, we beat USC and, and I asked Bill Little to go find Coach and Miss Edith because I wanted them out there with Sally and I because they are the University of Texas football program. And as you would figure, Coach says, nope, not coming out there, it's your time, you enjoy this. And we got back to the dressing room, back to the bus, and Miss Edith had taken a roll of tape. And we had this big truck out there that took all of our equipment, and it had three national championships, and she had taken adhesive tape that she'd tape ankles with, and she'd taped a big four over the three, and she said, now we have four national championships. Edith, we love you. Coach, we love you. We're going to miss you so much. Uh, rest in peace, and thanks for all you've given all of us.